Dear Church, let's talk politics and Christianity with Wes McAdams. Hello and welcome to the Dear Church Podcast. I'm your host, Chris McCurley, and you might as well be my co-host. You're on here all the time. My good friend, Wes McAdams, is joining us all the way from the Dallas area. Wes, thanks for being on today. Hey, brother. It's good to, good to be with you. Yeah, tell us what's going on in your world and uh, let our viewers and listeners know all about you. Yeah, uh, well, um, I've got I've got a couple boys that are about to go back to school. In fact, today is their first day back at school, and so that's that's big in our world. Baseball's big in our world, but I preach for the the Church of Christ on McDermott Road in in Plano, Texas, just north of the Dallas Metroplex, and uh, I have a podcast myself, at radicallychristian.com, But that's uh, keeping me pretty busy. Yeah, I bet it does, and it, and and I'm sure our viewers and listeners know all about the Radically Christian podcast. But if they don't, sir. Certainly get on and listen to that because it is outstanding. And uh, believe it or not, we're not related. I should say that to folks that, uh, you know, I know we look alike and I know that we get mistaken for each other quite a bit and I'm okay with that. But uh, yeah, not related, just good friends. We were together in Abilene for a while. You were at Baker Heights. I was at Oldham Lane. That's where we struck up our friendship. And uh, I've had you on the podcast many times as I've been on yours. And, and I just really appreciate your perspective on things which is why I wanted to get you on today, because uh, politics is one of those subjects that, uh, well, you can start a firestorm real quick with, right? And so uh, I want to take a balanced approach. I also want us to take more than anything, a biblical approach. And uh, I'm doing a series right now on idols, calling it American Idols. And one of the, one of the messages in that series is on politics. I haven't delivered it yet, but uh, uh, so I, I, this has been on my mind and my heart, and I know you've written about it and talked about it a lot uh, in, in the past. And so I just wanted to get your perspective, as I think we share the same view, in that let's start by saying neither you nor I are anti-politics. Um, we are more, although I will say personally, I'm getting more and more anti-politics, um, but I think we're more on the side of keeping it in its proper place. Am I right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I think it's helpful, too, to define what politics are or is. It's one of those funny words. I don't know if it's <laughs> singular or plural, but it, it's really helpful to define politics, that politics, I, I had a, a political professor one time explain it to me as who gets what, when, and how. And I thought that was really yeah. helpful. It's the system by which we decide as a community or as a, as a, as a, nation or whatever the case may be, who gets what, when, and how, who gets to vote, who gets a say, who gets who gets financial help, who gets roads, who gets whatever it is, whatever the infrastructure is, or the system that it is, or the economy, all of these things are de decided by politics. And so it is something we should be concerned about. We should be concerned about who gets what, when, and how. We should be concerned about our neighbor in particular. We should be concerned about the poor. We should be concerned about the marginalized. And if our nation is going to give us a say in how that gets decided, I, I think there's a there's something to be said for Christians participating in that process. But at the same time, I'm glad you brought up the the idea of idolatry, because I do think that if we're not careful, the the way that we engage in politics can very easily slide into idolatry. We see this throughout yeah. throughout Scripture. I've heard it described this way: politics is a compound word, poly meaning many, and ticks, which are blood sucking creatures. You know, <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, uh, politics and politicians. Uh, receive a bad rap nowadays. Uh, they're not looked upon in a very positive light, and and rightfully so to some degree, right? I mean, you, you think about um, you know the the candidates that have been uh, offered up to us over the last election, several election cycles, and you know it just seems like yeah, sometimes you're picking between the lesser of two evils almost, and and uh, it's hard to find one that represents you uh, as a as a Christian on. Uh, every topic or every every hot button issue, and and so it sometimes makes it difficult because you think, well, okay, here's one place where I really agree with them, but here's another place that I just, you know, I feel like I'm violating my Christian principles if I vote for them, right? And so I think it's important to also define what exactly it is that we're talking about when it comes to uh, politics and and this type of structure, in that it is a man made system, and anytime you're dealing with a man made system. You're going to have corruption. 
you're going to have immorality, uh, and you're going to have a system or a kingdom that is going to fall. And I think that that is a biblical, right? Um, you know, especially when, you know, the, the Israelites wanted a king, you know, and Jesus, God says, you've got the best king you could ever imagine. You know, why would you want, uh, yeah, they wanted to be like the nations around them. And by and large, it was a really bad idea. They had some good kings, but most, most of them were bad and it was corrupt and it brought injustice on the people. And, and, uh, so you have to kind of keep it in its proper perspective and understand that this is, this is not a, a system that is going to, uh, be perfect by any means. Yeah. Yeah, well, and I think that's exactly why it becomes idolatrous if we're not careful, because anytime we take, I like Tim Keller's definition of an idol, anytime we take a good thing and make it an ultimate thing, it becomes yes. a false god, it becomes an idol. And and you're exactly right, these systems that we've used to decide who gets what, when, and how, with these systems that we've we've come to to formulate to create they are creations and they can be a good thing a limited good thing to say okay democracy or a a democratic republic or all of the different forms and systems of government that people have come up with over the years they can serve a good in helping people and providing infrastructure whatever the case may be but when we take those systems and we make them ultimate things and we put our trust in them and we devote our loyalty and our allegiance to them, then we do. We become blind to their weaknesses. We become blind to their faults. And that happens with the system. So I would say we can't, we can't make the donkey or the elephant or the eagle into our idols. We cannot take the, the, the party or a politician or the whole system of government and elevate that and make it an ultimate thing as if it's not going to fall. I think about uh, what the Lord said to the people during Isaiah's day. Uh, it says, Isaiah 31, verse 1, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses, who trust in chariots because they are many, and in horsemen because they are very strong, but do not look to the Holy One of Israel or consult the Lord. He says in verse 3, The Egyptians are man and not God, and their horses are flesh and not spirit. It, yeah. it wasn't just that Israel had a tendency to adopt the gods of other nations, but they actually made other nations and empires and governments and militaries into idols themselves and put their trust in those nations. And yeah. we can do the same thing. If we put our trust and our hope and give our ultimate loyalty and allegiance to the American government or the American military or democracy or the Republican Party or the Democratic Party, then we're doing the exact same thing. We're, we're failing to see that they are flawed, that ultimately they will fail, that ultimately all of these things will crumble and that the kingdom of God is the only thing that will last forever. Yeah, well said. And, and I think that, uh, you know, maybe a lot of this goes back to, you know, our comfortability and our convenience here on earth. And, you know, we have benefited from, by and large, having the government on our side as Christians, having their support. Um, it hasn't always been that way, and it's likely to not always be that way. But for a while now, we have enjoyed that. And I think it's gotten us comfortable and to the point where we just assume it's always going to be there and that we have to have it. And I think that's the big thing is we believe that we need the government, that we have to have the government support in order to be uh, successful as the church. And, and nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, the, the church grew the fastest when it was a fledgling body just getting off the ground and it by no means had government support. In fact, the government was opposed to it. And uh, I, I think it's, um, you know, I think sometimes we lose sight of that and believe that we, and, and I think sometimes we as Christians expect the government to uphold our Christian values and you're going to be disappointed every time if you believe that's going to happen, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I, there's a passage in James that I think of a lot when it comes to this subject, because I, I think that the people that James is writing to had this tendency to want to be protected by and provided by the, the wealthy people in their community. And James is reminding them that these people are, are not helping you. In fact, they're hurting you in so many ways. And they were doing things like if, if a wealthy person came into their assembly, they were giving them a seat of honor as if 
there was something special in being wealthy and powerful. And he says something in James 4. He says, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose, do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealousy over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. I think there was this idea that they were becoming friends with the world because they felt like they needed the protection and the providence of these wealthy benefactors. So they were becoming friends with them in order to get their protection. And James is saying, you don't need their protection. You don't need right. their favor. You don't need their friendship. What you need is the Lord. And you are actually dividing your loyalty between these wealthy benefactors and the Lord rather than simply trusting in him. And God is jealous for your heart and your mind. And we can fall into the same trap. And we feel like unless we have a friend in the White House, unless we have a friend in Congress, unless we have friends in the government, then we're doomed to fail. A, a wealthy person in our culture just recently said that if something doesn't change, then Christianity is going to, I forget how he said it, but it's going to go extinct. It's going to fail because we have to stand up for Christianity and nothing could be further from the truth. We don't right. have to have friends in the White House or friends in the Congress in order to succeed. We cannot lose. Our kingdom will not fail. And the, the sooner we realize that, not only will it bring a, a peace of mind, but it also change the way we interact with the people around us and with the government itself. Yeah, it's the convenience factor again. We think, well, if we just vote the right person in, that uh, it's going to be great for us. And even if you have someone in the White House who... Um, you know, has a moral compass of some sort or maybe is against, uh, say, abortion, um, they're still not preaching the gospel, right? They're, they're, they're still not, uh, they're still not doing that, which is our number one responsibility. So it still rests back on us. And I've said it over and over again. You don't change the world through politics. You change the world one soul at a time. And so while it is nice to have government support, while it's nice that they uphold your values and some of the biblical principles that you believe in, at the end of the day, it is up to us as kingdom citizens to promote a different kingdom, a better kingdom and you know, our king is the Messiah, Jesus. He reigns supreme. And like you said, he's going to win no matter what. Um, but I, I still, I think it's this convenience factor that we, we you know, kind of default to because, you know, we want it as comfortable as we can uh, get it here and make our job as easy as possible. But that may not always be the case. You know, I, I had somebody tell me the other day that they firmly believed that uh, God placed Trump in office the first time. And, um, you know, that he was put there by God. Well, maybe Obama was put there by God. Maybe, maybe that person that you didn't vote for and that you vehemently disagreed with their policies and everything, maybe God put them there as well. I mean, what is God's will in all of this? Maybe it's that we do have to face some difficult times. Maybe it is so that our country, um, you know, maybe for a reason, uh, like benevolence reason, like God used in the Old Testament, you know, evil kings to bring people into compliance or, or things of that nature. Um, who's to say, right? And so this idea that we're going to put all of our eggs in the basket of, you know, politics and who's in the White House in order to succeed in our mission, that it's just it's just a wrong motive, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think that God is is involved in what happens in the world, obviously, Romans 13. But but at the same time, we have to recognize that just because God raises someone up, God raised up Cyrus, God used Nebuchadnezzar. There, there were all kinds of people that God raised up throughout history to do something according to his will. But that doesn't mean that that person was a, a good person or a person that they should give their loyalty to or their allegiance to or put their trust in or have that king or that ruler be their protector or their provider. And so, yes, there's going to be a revolving door on the White House, and that's the system of government that we live in. And there are going to be all kinds of people that come and go from the White House, and God will use whoever is there 
to accomplish something according to his will. But that doesn't mean that this is our kingdom. This is not our kingdom. We are citizens of a different kingdom. We are guests here. We are sojourners here. We are, we are travelers. We are foreigners here. We belong to a multinational, multi-ethnic, multilingual nation of people all over the world that are our brothers and sisters and citizens of our kingdom. And we always have to keep that in mind. That doesn't mean that what happens in this country or the policy that are decided are unimportant because they are important. We're talking about our neighbors and we're talking about the welfare of the people around us. Those things are important, but there is something that is bigger and more important and more lasting than the things that happen and get decided in this country. No, totally agree. I had an elder tell me one time that he hasn't voted in the last probably 20 elections and he was looked down upon by some unfavorably. You know, uh, even told that he was being irresponsible because, you know, he, you have this opportunity. God has gifted you with the opportunity to vote, uh, for, um, you know, uh, president and for the people that rule over you. And, and why would you not take advantage of that? And, uh, I've even heard it said that it is sinful if you don't vote, right? Uh, what would you say to that? I mean, uh, obviously we, we don't believe that's true, but, uh, you know, a lot of times, the proof text is Romans chapter 13, which is interesting because there's a lot to unpack there. But really, Romans chapter 13 is a chapter talking about love. Right. But we've we've made it about politics. But what would you say to someone who says, you know what, I just don't feel comfortable voting for either candidate. And so therefore, I'm just going to I'm not going to be involved in the political process. I have nothing to do with that. Well, it's so funny. Romans 13 comes right between Romans 12 and Romans 14, obviously. And yes. and if people sat down and read Romans 12 about loving one another, being hospitable to one another, loving our enemies, feeding our enemies when they're hungry, giving them something to drink when they're thirsty, right. blessing people that persecute us and that curse us, this is the context of this is the way Christians are supposed to live. And then Paul briefly gets into this idea of what is the role of the government and specifically what is what is the submission to the government and why should Christian people, followers of Jesus, submit to the government rather than resist and rebel against the, the governing authorities. And he's saying, hey, God is using the government to accomplish his, his will. Now, then we have Romans 14, and Paul is really, he's bringing together this multi-ethnic group of, of Christians in Rome that are trying to figure out life together, specifically Jews and Gentiles. And he knows that they're going to have differences of opinion, and they're going to work out the logical conclusions of what does following Jesus look like in the everyday what should I eat? What should I wear? How should I live? It's going to look different and people are going to come to different conclusions. And he tells them to love one another, to accept one another, to not argue about opinions. And I think this is exactly the sort of thing that we're going to run into is we're going to yeah. say, hey, I think that as a follower of Jesus, we should use our vote this way. And another person will say, no, no, no. I think as a follower of Jesus, we should use our vote that way. And another person is going to say, no, I don't think we should participate at all in the voting process. I, I don't think that that's our kingdom at all. And they can all come to those conclusions in a reasonable, logical, faithful, biblical way, and they're all right. Nobody's wrong. And they're, they're, they've come to those conclusions as a matter of faith. And, yes. and that's what Paul says. Whatever is not of faith is sin. But if you've come to this conclusion in good faith, if someone else has come to a different conclusion in good faith, then accept one another and love one another, be patient with one another, and don't draw a line and say, if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, you have to come to these opinions, to these conclusions, to these inferences. You have to al allow for differences of opinion within the body of Christ. And, and that's exactly, I think, where this, this topic falls. Yeah. I mean, it's about something bigger. And uh, I think that's what Paul is constantly referencing because, I mean, his letters were so much about unity. They were among other things as well, but they were about unity as much as anything. And, you know, how do we get on the same page and how are we, there's something bigger here. And uh, somebody doesn't have to be wrong. 
uh, we can we can all have our opinions and and move forward. It just I think it also relates back to the idolatry problem, and and I think the folks who have made an idol out of politics would say, no, I haven't. I don't, you know, that's crazy. But when it becomes all consuming and it affects the way you treat other people who disagree with you, and then then obviously there's a problem. May not be full blown idolatry, but there's there's obviously a problem. And uh, if it's harming your relationships, if it's harming the church, then obviously um, it needs to be, you know, set aside for the greater good. Um, you know, Wes, I, I feel like we're coming up on election season and I feel like all this gets ramped up, you know, uh, 10 times, you know, uh, hotter than what it usually is. And the, the temperature of our culture is one that everybody's fighting all the time. You scroll through social media, everyone's mad at each other for something. And politics is certainly uh, behind most of it, if not all of it. Um, how do we as Christians uh, navigate these waters uh, through this season? How, how do we how do we show the world that there's something better, that, mm. you know, that this is not all that there is and it shouldn't take uh all of our time and energy and effort and cause us to be something we shouldn't be. Yeah. I think that's exactly it. I, I think that that scripture doesn't explicitly tell us here's how you live in a democratic republic. Here, here's how you here's yeah. how you vote or here's how you don't vote. It doesn't explicitly tell us that, but it does tell us that love is patient, love is kind, it doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, it isn't rude, it isn't self-seeking. It tells us that the fruit of the spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness. This is what scripture explicitly tells us. And so you're going to have differences of opinion with your brothers and sisters and with your neighbors on what's the right way to vote or should we vote or should we abstain from voting or what if you vote for this person or what if you vote for that person? You're going to have differences of opinion on those things. And it's okay to differ on those things, but it's not okay to lay aside love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness. If we lay those things aside, if we say, Say, hey, voting for the right person and electing the right person is more important than the fruit of the Spirit. It's more important than the way I treat other people, then we have left the way of Jesus. And the end does not justify the means. In Christianity, it's all about the means. It is all about how we live, how we journey together towards the kingdom of God. And so yes. we, we, we cannot lay these things aside. I, I know that people get so ramped up because of the, the fear, the animosity, the anger that we hear. We're always told this is the most important election that's ever been. And if the right person doesn't get elected, everything's going to fall apart. And so our anxiety is through the roof. And so we think that, okay, I, it, it doesn't matter you know, how I treat people. The, that's not really that important. What's really important is who we elect. And what's really important is how we vote. Again, that goes back to a revelation that this has become idolatrous for us. It has become ultimate to us. Yes. What is ultimate is Jesus. What is ultimate is, is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and His kingdom. This has got to be where our heart and our mind lie so that we have this, this peace of mind. The motto that I always like to, to encourage people to adopt is engaged but not entangled. I think yeah. it's good to be engaged, but it's not good to be entangled. And when we get entangled in politics, we get so wrapped up in it, it becomes our identity, it becomes our life, and this cannot be the way of followers of Jesus. I like that, engaged but not entangled. What uh, what are you going to do, if anything, uh, from the pulpit? I, I've, I've been asked that question, you know, do you approach politics? I'm not really a current events preacher. Um, you know, if things pop up, we, we talk about it. But for the most part, I don't, you know, like they used to say, you have a Bible in one hand, newspaper in the other. I don't I don't really do that. Um, you know, I, I've preached on abortion and things like that. And people say, well, thank you for preaching on politics. That's that's not politics. So those are biblical issues, first and foremost. Um, so I don't really get into, you know, politics from the pulpit as far as preaching, you know, who you should vote for and all that kind of stuff. Uh, how do you approach it? Do you, do you say anything or do you do like I do and just trying to redirect people back to what's most important, Jesus and the gospel? Well, I mean, it sounds like a bumper sticker, but I always tell people my politics are simple. Jesus is king. 
And yes. that is a political statement. And so yeah. if somebody asks, do you preach politics? I say, absolutely, I preach Every politics. Sunday. <laughs> Every Sunday. Well, I preach yeah. Jesus is king, and I am a part of his kingdom, and this is political. And, and But it's a different kind of politics. It's not a worldly politics. It's a politics that transcends earthly politics. And so I, I've been preaching all year because I knew this season was coming up. I've been right. preaching on loyalty. And so I've been focused a lot on how faith, how that, that, that Greek word pistis is about allegiance. It's about loyalty. It's about f- fidelity. And so I'm, I'm going to do a series on Revelation coming up all about loyalty to the Lamb, we have got to recognize that in every generation, God's people have been tempted to give their allegiance to the beasts, to give their allegiance to empire, to give their allegiance to worldly kingdoms, and our allegiance has got to be to the Lamb. We have got to be have our loyalty belong completely and totally to Jesus, and then we can have a peace that passes understanding, and we can love one another regardless of what happens with earthly politics. Yeah, very well said. I, I, I wanted to close out this discussion by talking about a good place to land, but I think you've answered that. You said engaged but not entangled, you know, not anti-politics, just anti-idolatry, right? And, uh, you know, I am one that, uh, you know, I, I feel like it would be great if more Christians were involved. I think we need more Christians involved in the political process, and I, I would love to see that. Uh, at the same time, um, you know, you can get consumed to the point where you lose your identity. And uh, now, uh, like I've said before, your identity is not Republican or Democrat. It's Christian, and that's the only identity that you really have. And it saturates everything else. But if we're wrapping this up and putting a bow on it, Where's a good place to land in all of this? Well, I think I think First Peter is a phenomenal book. If somebody is looking to figure out how should I be engaged in the world, First Peter is a fantastic book because it encourages us to see ourselves as sojourners, as foreigners. And I always ask myself, if I was living in Japan, if I was living in Estonia, if I was living in wherever, how would I engage in conversations about culture and politics? Well, I think I would want to be engaged as much as they would allow me to, but I would also yeah. recognize this isn't my home country. This isn't my homeland. Right. My homeland is somewhere else. And we have to remember that here. I am a missionary living in the United States of America. I happen to be born here and I and I happen to love it here, but I'm I'm a foreigner here. I'm a sojourner right. here. I'm a missionary here. And we all have to adopt that mentality and say To whatever degree I can, I'm going to seek the welfare of the community around me, just as the the exiles in Babylon did. But at the end of the day, I have to recognize the United States of America is not my homeland. My homeland is the kingdom of God. I'm waiting for that city. That's where my heart belongs. I love it. Yes. Uh, and, And, you know, I hope that our viewers and listeners have taken this from a from a perspective that we're trying to give, which is, you know, loving, compassionate as always, and trying to help folks understand that, uh, you know, your kingdom's not of this world. Jesus is king. He reigns supreme. And uh, so no matter what happens, we're going to be okay. You know, it's, it's going to be okay. Uh, we may have to deal with some things in the meantime as exiles, but it's going to be okay. Wes, thanks for joining us, man. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate I appreciate all that you do to point people to Jesus and, and promote his kingdom. Well, same here. I appreciate you. And I, I want our listeners and viewers to know that if you have a question about today's episode, you can email me at chris.mccurley at rippleoflight.com. And if you have a specific question for Wes, uh, I'm sure he'd be willing to answer that and we will forward it on to him and keep up with Wes, the Radically Christian. Uh, great website. There's podcasts, there's articles, uh, there's sermons that you can find him uh, at uh, the Church of Christ on McDermott Road. And so, uh, Wes, thank you so much again and look forward to seeing you soon, buddy. Likewise. Thanks, brother. Yes. And thank everyone for tuning in. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you sincerely, Chris.